so You're listening to a Mamma Mia podcast. Mamma Mia acknowledges the traditional owners of land and waters that this podcast is recorded on. Hi everyone, Gemma here dropping into your feed because Ghislaine Maxwell has just been sentenced to 20 years behind bars. We actually did a whole episode on her life and crimes only a few weeks ago. And in case you missed it, we wanted to bring it back to the top of your feed so you can get across why she received this sentence. It's only a few hours after sunrise on July 2, 2020. And FBI agents silently surround a luxurious, secluded home in the American state of New Hampshire as eagle-eyed helicopters keep watch overhead. They've descended on a quiet, quaint corner of Bradford. The house they're targeting is nestled amongst the trees and has a sign on the gate that aptly reads, Tucked Away. They knock on the door, demanding they be let inside. Open up, it's the police. They notice movement through the living room window. A woman darts into another room and closes the door behind her. It's Ghislaine Maxwell, a well-known British-American socialite and former girlfriend of convicted pedophile Jeffrey Epstein. She's been evading the FBI's cat-and-mouse chase for more than a year, but they finally have her cornered. Within seconds, she's being led away in handcuffs. The daughter of one of the former richest men in Britain is about to be accused of grooming, recruiting and trafficking dozens of teenage girls to be sexually abused by Epstein and allegedly some of the richest, most high-profile men in the world. I'm Gemma Bath and this is True Crime Conversations, a Mamma Mia podcast exploring the world's most notorious crimes by speaking to the people who know the most about them. Today's episode is the second in our series about the Maxwells. If you haven't yet heard our discussion about Robert Maxwell, it might be worth scrolling back to last week's episode to take a listen, because today we're focusing on his daughter, Ghislaine. Helping us do that is Nigel Cawthorn, the author of Ghislaine Maxwell, The Fall of America's Most Notorious Socialite. Ghislaine is well known for her association with Jeffrey Epstein and in 2020, she was arrested for her role in his sex trafficking operation. Ghislaine grew up in a very wealthy family. Nigel, what did her childhood look like? Ghislaine was the youngest of 10 children and she had rather a difficult time because her father's favourite, Michael, who he thought was going to take over his business empire, suffered a, a horrendous car accident and was unconscious for many years and died just about the time that Ghislaine was uh, born. So it was very difficult in the house. She became her father's favourite, but uh, he was um, an ogre. He spoiled her and uh, abused her in equal measure. Is it true that he treated her a lot better than her siblings, even though he was a bit of an ogre to her at times as well? I think he spoiled her more. He abused them all. He he was a real tyrant of a father, a very unpleasant man, but then he came from a very difficult background himself. What about her mother? What was she like? We know so much about Robert because he was this media mogul. He was you know, a huge personality. He was one of the richest men in Britain. But what about Betty Maxwell? Uh, she was French, so they married uh, just at the uh, end of the war in France. In fact, like, uh, Ghislaine was born in Paris. Well, she put up <laughs> with her husband, including his serial infidelity, but uh, they kind of separated towards the end of her life. She was a, a considerable um, intellectual and had a great uh, academic career and uh, wrote rather scathing autobiography that uh, really dished the dirt on her husband. I've heard her described as a bit of an enabler, which is a really interesting phrase given, you know, what we're going to be talking about with Ghislaine, but she enabled her husband to, you know, be the ogre that you describe him as. She certainly didn't stop him. and She didn't kind of overrule him in family matters. And obviously they lived a very rich and privileged life, really thanks to his abilities in, in business. As Ghislaine grew up and became a woman, how much of her personality do you think was wrapped up in being, you know, Robert Maxwell's daughter? 
I mean, Ghislaine was absolutely under the thrall of her father that uh, as she grew up, uh, she, I mean, she only went to university because he endowed the, the Oxford College with a, a large amount of money, so they took her in. And then she went to work for him. So she never really sort of grew up and had an independent life away from him. Unlike her two older sisters who fled to America and became very successful in, in the computer industry over there. And uh, one of her older brothers, who again, I think he fled to Argentina to get as far away from his father as possible. What was her job title while she was working with her father? Because I'll admit, in my research, I struggled to find one. She seemed to be kind of a master of everything. <laughs> yes, a dog's body, I yeah. think. Yeah. When he wanted to get into America and take over uh, New York Daily News, uh, she was sent out there to fix things. She, she was a very social woman, and she made all the contacts that he needed over there, including with Donald Trump and, of course, Jeffrey Epstein. Ghislaine's father dies in 1991, and it's revealed after his death that he's a crook. He stole hundreds of millions from his employees. How did Ghislaine cope with his death and the aftermath? Galena almost immediately moved to New York to live there, and she already knew Jeffrey Epstein. It's been alleged that uh, a lot of the missing money was uh, sent to Jeffrey Epstein, who was very good at hiding bent money. And this is where she got really in tight with Mr Epstein. And is it true that she met Epstein through her dad? No, she met her on a, of her own accord, but she was doing business for her father. They were tied together in that way. So um, he was instrumental in, in their meeting. Jeffrey Epstein, let's bring him in here for a second. Who was he, you know, in the early 90s? What was his business? What was he doing with himself? He was um, a man from a very modest background in Brooklyn, became a maths teacher, and then moved on to Wall Street. His uh, job was actually finding missing money for clients. And it's always rather mysterious exactly where his, his money came from. But as I say, a lot of it does seem to have come from, uh, from Maxwell. And he does get quite wealthy, doesn't he? Or, well, seemingly wealthy. He gets enormously wealthy to the extent of what, what we normally think is an oligarch. Again, but rather mysterious where this money's been coming from. Were Ghislaine and Epstein in a relationship? Were they lovers? Because she moves from, you know, England to New York and after her father dies, she starts to spend a lot of time with Epstein. Is that where a, a relationship forms? Yes, in, indeed. And initially, they do seem to have had a relationship. But then, then he had a great reputation as a womanizer. I don't think he really wanted to stick with one woman for too long. And of course, he, he had an eye for much younger women. Which we'll get to in a second. But how would Ghislaine have helped Epstein? Because with her on his arm, suddenly there would be a lot of doors that would open, right? Oh, yes, indeed. He, he was rather unassuming man socially. So she kind of organised his social life for him and introduced him to high society on both sides of the Atlantic, of course, that uh, she had royal connections here in Britain. Nigel, give us a taste. Give us a an insight into who they were kind of bumping shoulders with during that time. There was a, a famous party, the Ball of the Century, which um, celebrated Andrew's 40th birthday, Prince Margaret's 60th, I think, and the Queen Mother's, I can't remember, was it 90th birthday, I think. So this was a must-go-to party. And, of course, Ghislaine and Jeffrey Epstein turn up to this at Prince Andrew's invitation. So, yeah, they're rubbing shoulders with royalty, you know, dignitaries, presidents, everyone. Indeed. The who's who of America, England, basically the world, really. Indeed, and we've seen more recently pictures of Epstein and Ghislaine holidaying in a cottage on the Balmoral Estate in Scotland, the Queen's Scottish residence. So, yes, yeah, so they were living the high life in royal circles. Do you think Ghislaine knew early on that Epstein had a preference, like you said earlier, for young girls? Because that seems to be a fact that was thrown around these parties as a bit of a rumour. Oh, yes, indeed. Um, Donald Trump is famous for having made reference to um, the fact that, that he and Epstein were very similar because they liked beautiful women, but uh, that Jeffrey liked rather younger ones. Do we know when Ghislaine started to get 
involved in this preference, for want of a better word, in younger girls, in, in children? Yeah, I don't think we can put a precise date on, on it, but uh, she became Epstein's sort of prime uh, facilitator. She ran his various households and she organised his social diary and social events. So it seems to have occurred quite early on. So would she introduce him to these girls? Was that her role? She would actively go out scouting for girls and driving around and stopping and picking up the young girls off the pavement and introducing them to Geoffrey, offering them money to provide a massage and then one thing led to another. When we say girls, how young are we talking? Probably the youngest is about 14, but uh, certainly under legal age. And you mentioned that she would offer money, but you know, a strange woman comes up to you in a bathroom or at your place of work or on the street and kind of says, come with me, there's a man wanting a massage. Like, how how does she gain their trust? Well, first of all, they were rather impressed by her British accent or, as I was like to think of it, lack of accent because this is the way it's supposed to be spoken. (laughs) But uh, she picked up vulnerable young women who wanted money or they wanted some sort of career possibly in massage therapy, or they had some sort of aspirations to be a model, and he had connections there. He was a partner in a modelling agency, and um, he had a a hand in Victoria's Secrets. So there were a lot of opportunities that he could offer them. What do we know about the kinds of things that happened to these girls, these children, behind closed doors with Epstein? It would begin with, with them being taken into the massage room where pretty soon his towel would come off and then they would be asked to undress to a certain extent, if not completely naked. Sometimes uh, Ghislaine would be there to kind of instruct them how Geoffrey liked his massage and sometimes she would uh, strip off as well and encourage them to have sex with him. So was she involved in the sexual activity itself as well? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And how often was this happening? Was it, you know, weekly, daily? It seems to have been several times a day. Yeah, wow. He he was very demanding in that department. And his victims, and there are hundreds, sometimes, you know, they would be abused once, sometimes there were multiple. They had these girls kind of working for them in other areas or they were grooming them. They were part of their kind of network, weren't they? Yes, indeed. They would be called on regularly for their services. Yes, she she, she ran a a stable, if you like. What does Ghislaine get out of this? Like, why would she do this? Well, first of all, she she lived the lifestyle that formerly her father had provided for her. So she was uh, wealthy enough to go to every social event that was going on in, in New York and Los Angeles and the south of France. She was the ultimate socialite then. As I say, she joined participated in some of the sexual activities. So I can only assume that she enjoyed that too. Was there, you know, an infatuation, a a love for Epstein? Do you think that was part of it as well? Indeed. Every photograph you see of them together, she seems to be starry-eyed and staring at him. We know that a lot of this abuse happened at Epstein's New York townhouse, but This wasn't just happening there, was it? It was kind of happening all over the world at multiple kind of locations. There were certain principal locations. As you say, his New York townhouse, his residence in Florida, and he had this private island in the American Virgin Islands where all sorts of things went on. He had a ranch out in New Mexico where they occasionally went. He had a private jet, the so-called Lolita Express, well, you know, there's a clue in that, where things went on too. It's quite remarkable to think about because they'd created this, as you called it, a stable where they would call on these women, but that's quite an operation. And was Ghislaine the puppet master? She was the one kind of organising the girls and, like, that is a huge operation if you're doing it across multiple continents. She was a masterful organiser of these things. And, you know, she obviously had some of her her father's acumen in that department. I forgot to mention that that they also had an apartment in Paris where activities went on too, and the French authorities are still looking into that. 
When did Epstein and Maxwell start getting other men involved? Because it wasn't just the two of them. They started to traffic to other people. Yes, that seems to have developed quite slowly over the years. We don't know whether this is possibly they needed this for blackmail purposes, as a lot of the activities were filmed on concealed cameras. And, you know, it was also a a sort of uh, a favour that... uh, Epstein could provide for clients. When you say they might have done it for blackmail purposes, do you mean that, you know, to kind of hide what they were doing, they would get other people involved so they too were kind of in it with them? Well, that was certainly that it would uh, help them cover their tracks, but they would be allowed to be able to persuade people to do other things for them if they had the dirt on them. I want to get to Virginia a bit later and her story, but Nigel, I'd love to hear from you. You've done a book on this. You've researched thoroughly. What are some of the stories from the survivors, from the victims that have really stood out to you? It's quite difficult to pick out individual cases because there's simply so many of them and they all seem to uh, follow the same pattern. And, of course, when these girls finally get too old for Epstein to be interested, the summary dumped and of course some of them fall into drug abuse and and, and have quite miserable lives subsequently and of course if he's managed to get them into sidelines like modeling or into Hollywood suddenly once they've lost his patronage then their careers kind of disappear too. When you say they got too old how old are we talking well, essentially, when they became women into their early 20s, that there aren't any over sort of 23. You're listening to True Crime Conversations with me, Gemma Bath. I'm speaking with author Nigel Cawthorn about the fall of Ghislaine Maxwell. I want to skip to 2005 because... It's that year that a victim's parents go to the police and an investigation starts, an undercover investigation. And we're skipping forward again here a bit, but basically nothing comes of a federal investigation and Epstein is eventually charged with state offences, which he pleads guilty to, and he's sentenced to 18 months in prison. Where's Ghislaine in all of this? Does she get into trouble as Epstein is around this time? Uh, No, they seem to completely uh, ignore Ghislaine's uh, role in this. And indeed, later, when when he's prosecuted again, there seems to be no interest in her until he's committed suicide and they they feel that they need someone to prosecute. She kind of pointed out this in her defence, that she says she'd kind of turn into a scapegoat because they couldn't prosecute uh, Jeffrey because he was dead. And there is some validity to that, except that, that obviously that she was kind of the mastermind behind the whole operation, so is culpable. Knowing what we know now, it's hard to believe that she wouldn't have been charged or uh, arrested at least in that you know initial investigation because she is so interlinked with this. Was this some kind of deal that Epstein made or, or she made with prosecutors? Epstein was very generous to uh, the local police force in Florida, which helped a a whole lot. This deal that was done originally back in in, in Florida, being passed off on the state charges. And remember you say he he, he was given 18 months in jail. Well, most of that, he, he was allowed out every day to work. And most of the work took place in his own house. He was actually seeing other underage woman during the sentence. So this wasn't even a slap on the wrist. If he was let off so lightly, why would they be interested in her? How was he let off so lightly? It was a really serious charge. In America, money talks. He was immensely wealthy and uh, he had important uh, contacts with people so he could get away with just about anything he, he liked. And of course, after that initial charge and, and, and conviction, of course, he, he was essentially accepted back into society as if nothing had happened. And was Ghislaine as well? Did they just kind of swan into their social parties as if nothing had happened? Ghislaine really never dropped out of the scene at all. Everything was overlooked. 
After he was released from prison, did they link up again or did she kind of keep her distance given everything that had happened? They weren't seen together socially so much, but no, she, but she was still on that scene providing girls for him. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. So kind of behind the scenes, she was still doing what he went to prison for. Yes, yes. Publicly, we know that Ghislaine throws herself into work after he goes to prison and is released and she launches an ocean-based digital platform. She's all about saving the planet and saving the ocean. She speaks at the UN. She speaks at unis. Was that her attempt to kind of rebrand herself and did it work? Uh, Yes, it it was. uh, And I think it probably did work to a certain extent. And of of course, Jeffrey did similar things, holding scientific uh, conferences, even inviting Stephen Hawking to uh, his private island in the Virgin Islands. Skipping forward again, and we're in 2015 now, and a woman named Virginia Roberts Jeffrey sells her story to the Daily Mail. What does she say in those initial allegations? She says that that she was working at the sports club at the spa in uh, Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago in Florida when she was approached by uh, Ghislaine Maxwell. She was sitting outside actually reading a book about massage therapy. So that was the perfect introduction for Ghislaine to come up to her and say, oh, you're interested in that. I know a rich man who wants that sort of service. Come along, I'll introduce you and, and we can get you professional training and then takes her uh, to Epstein's house. Whereas I I, I say that she's introduced to him, his towel comes off. Ghislaine's uh, showing her how Jeffrey likes to be massaged and she's encouraged to strip off and uh, Ghislaine does too. She goes on to say that she was held as a sex slave for three years and was trafficked to... And the name that is used in the article and the name that creates so many kind of ripples in, across the world is Prince Andrew. Yes, indeed. Virginia was essentially part of the household. She lived with Ghislaine and Epstein and, and travelled with, with them. And every so often, Epstein would, would uh, order her and give her money to provide massage services for other people. She was brought over to England and introduced to Prince Andrew, and told to um, provide the same services that she did to Geoffrey to Prince Andrew. So that's the kind of photo that people might recognise of Prince Andrew next to a very young Virginia and there's Ghislaine in the background. And it's that photo that's kind of splashed across every publication in the country. And, of course, there's this huge focus on a prince being embroiled in this allegation But I'm really interested in Ghislaine's part in this because suddenly she's involving, you know, royalty in this crime that she has going with Epstein. The three of them seem to believe that they're they're kind of above the law. They can get away with anything. The more outrageous it is getting Prince Andrew involved, the better. And of course... Coming from the sort of privileged background he does, it's quite it's quite easy for him to fall in into this as well. With Maxwell being named in this particular story, which is then republished so many times, is this the first time that she's properly publicly accused alongside Epstein? Yes. These things were kind of known about before, but it was only essentially with that picture, with Prince Andrew, that this really hits the headlines worldwide. What are the ramifications for her, for Maxwell? Well, again, very little at the time. The concentration legally seemed always to go after Epstein, which eventually led to his downfall. There is a defamation suit that is put to Maxwell from Virginia. Can you talk us through that? Because I find that really interesting. You can explain. What did she say about Virginia's claims? Ghislaine said that Virginia was lying essentially. So Virginia sued Ghislaine for defamation and eventually the case was dropped because Ghislaine simply had to pay Virginia off to keep quiet because by the time that they'd given um, their depositions, it was it was quite clear which way uh, a court would decide and then there was no way out other than tried and tested Jeffrey Epstein way, which was simply throw as much money as you've got at it. 
After all of this goes down, do we see much of Ghislaine publicly? She's such a, you know, a personality in the social circles. Does she continue to do that? She's not quite so so public, but she still keeps up her contacts. I mean, what else does a socialite have but, but her contact book? But in 2019, Epstein is arrested again and he's charged with sex trafficking minors. And this is the most recent incident where he dies by suicide in prison while he's awaiting trial. And I just find this such an interesting thing to have happened in Ghislaine's life because, as we touched on a bit earlier, her father dies in mysterious circumstances as well. Am I just making a strange parallel here? But it just feels so similar. Well, yes, in both cases, there's kind of disputed evidence of what happened. That When Robert Maxwell fell off his yacht, you know, everyone said, did he fall or was he pushed? Was it suicide? Did he have a heart attack? Was it an assassination? Because he had, he had uh, contacts both with the KGB, uh, MI6 and, and Mossad. It's also been alleged that Epstein had contacts with the CIA and Mossad. And there's circumstances around his suicide in jail that are very puzzling, that somehow both the guards who were supposed to be watching him seem to have gone to sleep at the same time. The CCTV outside his cell was mysteriously not working. He apparently managed to tie himself to the frame of his bed and, and collapse forward to hang himself, but that seems rather unlikely too. But as, as you say, the impact on her is much the same emotionally as the loss of her father. The strange thing I find is that she doesn't flee the country. If she'd gone across the border into Canada and flown to France, as a French citizen, she couldn't have been extradited to the US to face charges. Strangely, Virginia's lawyer advised her of this uh, earlier on. She, when the defamation case was going on uh, and they were taking depositions, Virginia's lawyer said to Ghislaine, you should either get in touch with, with the FBI and, and make a deal now or get the hell out of this country. And she didn't take that advice. She would be a, a free woman if she'd just simply gone back to France. That's so strange because she did things like change her name and I read that she had tin foil wrapped around her phone to kind of like stop the authorities from being able to get her. So why go to all those lengths if... You know, you could just easily skip over a few borders and be fine. It is very, very bizarre that, that she didn't do that, and I'm sure she's regretting it now. Yeah, so in 2020, she's dramatically arrested. Can you talk us through what happened? She was uh, in this hideaway in, in New Hampshire. It was like they were um, arresting some sort of drugs boss. You know, there were, there were helicopters, there were armed FBI officers, uh, there were the local police. Everyone was involved. She was grabbed. What was she arrested and charged for? Trafficking underage girls. And she was convicted of that, wasn't she? She was. There's a sentencing hearing coming up next month and uh, Virginia says that she's going to give a victim impact statement. I don't want to make out like she doesn't deserve what she got, but it is, you know, a bit bittersweet that Epstein didn't get to see his day in court, didn't get to see Virginia's testimony, and it's his right-hand woman that has to face the music. I think particularly for the victims, they all wanted to see uh, Epstein in court. It must be some comfort to them that Ghislaine was convicted. Strangely, Ghislaine put up almost no defence. She didn't even testify on her own behalf. Did we see any reaction from her? If she didn't testify, did we see, you know, facial expressions, any kind of remorse, any emotion? No remorse or, or any reaction at all. I guess she must figure that she's been banged to rights. It's so interesting because we've done a part one of this series looking at Robert Maxwell and now we're looking at Ghislaine and it's hard not to draw parallels between her relationship with her dad and the one she forms with Epstein, you know, these confident, know-what-they-want, brash kind of men and she does their bidding. And then at the end of the day, she's there left to deal in both instances with their crimes. And there's a third brash character here, which is Prince Andrew himself. In that car crash interview he did, he said it, he would uh, cooperate with the authorities and hasn't. If he didn't cooperate with them, he was supposed to appear in a public court. And as we know, none of this has happened. So he strenuously denies any wrongdoing, doesn't he? Yes, indeed. And uh, 
the UK is in, in breach of treaty with our, our closest ally over this matter, which I find it, it was shocking. Back to Ghislaine and Epstein for a minute. They got away with so much for so many years. Do you think watching all of this play out in the court system, in the justice system, is this just a case of the rich and famous getting more of a free pass than the rest of us? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Because there were allegations made by some of the victims of Epstein at these, inverted commas, parties with underage girls. Donald Trump was there. Well, (laughs) has he been questioned about this matter? I think he's got off scot-free here too. So for the victims in all of this, I guess there's still a lot out there that needs to happen for them to feel like they've got justice. Ghislaine is behind bars, but there's still so many unanswered questions, isn't there? Virginia certainly has an axe to grind with with Prince Andrew. You see, initially, I think she was 17 at the time, so it was legal for him to have sex with her in this country. However, under the Sex Trafficking Act, you can't transport someone for the purpose of sex under the age of 21 in in UK, in in English law. So if he knew that, that she'd been trafficked to him, brought from the United States to the UK to have sex with him, and she was being paid, then he would be culpable under that law. You know, if you or I break the law, then the police turn up at our front door. But it doesn't seem to happen to him. Lastly, I just wanted to ask, we're awaiting sentencing for Ghislaine. What are you expecting to see in that sentence? Hopefully not another kind of watered down (laughs) conviction or sentence like we saw with Epstein all those years ago? I don't think the authorities would dare do that again. I can't imagine that she's she's ever going to see daylight again. Nigel Cawthorn has been a writer for nearly 30 years. He's a journalist turned author who specialises in history and crime stories, several of which have become bestsellers. You can read more of his thoughts on this case in his book, Ghislaine Maxwell, The Fall of America's Most Notorious Socialite, which you'll find linked in our show notes. True Crime Conversations is a Mamma Mia podcast hosted by me, Gemma Bath, and my executive producer is Gia Moylan. If you have a case you think we should cover next, get in touch with us. Send an email to truecrime at mamamia.com.au or join our online community. Just search for True Crime Conversations on Facebook and make a request to join.